This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, uh, we're working through chapter seven of the uh, free lecture notes. Uh, and at the end of the last lecture, I suggested that you had to go at part A of uh, example three. Uh, we want an accelerated return, but before I explain how we get it, part A of example three asked us to calculate the NPV of the project at 15%. Uh, we'd done it at 10%. It was positive, we accept. We've now met guest at 15%. So let's see what the NPV is at 15%. Uh, we know the cash flows. It's 80,000 outflow at time zero. Inflows of 20,000. 30,000, 40,000, 10,000, but then another 10,000 at time four uh, from the scrap. So those are the cash flows. Uh, this time we're discounting at 15% uh, to get the present value. So 80,000 now is 80,000. Uh, the discount factors from your tables, the 15% column uh, for one year, 0 0.870, two years, 0 0.756, three years, 0 0.658, 0 0.572. And therefore the present values, 20,000 times 0.87, 17,400, 30,000 times 0 0.756, 22,680, 26,320. And finally, I do the two together again, a total of 20,000 in four years times 0.572. Eleven four forty. So, with interest uh, cost of capital at fifteen percent, the net present value, well, the inflows are seventeen four hundred plus twenty two six eighty. Oh, seventeen four hundred twenty two six eighty twenty six three twenty eleven four forty. Minus the outflow of 80,000. Well, I hope you did have a go yourself, but you should have got a negative NPV of 2160. As you'd expect, it is lower. We said that before. Higher cost of capital, higher cost of money, lower NPV. Uh, I wanted an NPV of zero. The internal rate of return, by definition, is when the NPV is zero. Well, we knew it was more than 10%, but it's not as high as 15. It's going to be somewhere between them. And what you could do is keep on guessing. You know, you could say, oh, well, let's now try 12%. Depending on whether that's plus or minus, let's try 13 and so on. Uh, but in the exam, no. In the exam, we always have two guesses. Here we did it at 10%, we've done it at 15%. And from those two guesses, we can estimate when the MPV would be zero. Now watch me carefully here. Um, people like to learn a formula for this. And if you want, you can, but you'll have to look in a study text. It's not given in the exam. Uh, and you don't need a formula. Formula can end up getting awfully confusing. If you see the logic, then it becomes obvious and you don't need to learn a formula. Just watch. We tried at 10% and we ended up with an MPV of plus 
We want to know what rate gives an MPV of 0, and we knew it was higher than 10, so we tried 15%, and the MPV was lower. It was minus 2160. I want an MPV of 0, it's somewhere between the two. What we say is this. Over a change of five percentages, 10 to 15, the MPV fell from plus 6,000 to minus 2,000. So in total, it's fallen by 8,000, um, 8,820, from plus 6 to minus 2, 8,820. And now we can write the internal rate of return almost straight down. We started with 10%. Actually, I'm changing colour, 10%. We knew it was more than 10%. The question is how much more? Well, to get to zero, I need that MPV to fall by 6,000 or something. We know that we'll get a fall of 8,000 by changing 5%. Well, if 8,000 is 5%, 4,000 would be half of it, 2.5%. 6,000, the fall we want, will be 6 eighths of 5%, or more precisely, 6660 divided by 8820 times 5%. Again, 8000 is equivalent to a change of 5%. We want a change of 6000 to get to zero. It'll be 6 eighths of 5%, which comes to 6660 divided by 8820 times 5 plus 10, 13.78 percent. Now arithmetically that's it. You know it's two guesses approximate between them. Um, in the exam, you'll almost certainly be told which guesses to use. If, uh, if not, then any two sensible guesses would do. I always make 10% as my first guess. Uh, and then the second guess, depending on whether at 10% it was positive or negative, I either guess or 5 or 15. But it doesn't matter. As I say, you'll probably be told in the exam which rates to use. But otherwise, just be sensible. I mean, I've done 10. I wouldn't do 11. I think 11 is unlikely to give the answer. But otherwise, I, any two will do. Um, secondly, although... Um, Generally speaking, we leave the internal rate of return to two decimal places. In fact, it's only an approximation. It's only approximate. And the reason is that if I drew a graph of the uh, MPV, as against the rate of interest, uh, you know, we did 10% and we got plus 6660. I then did 15% and we got minus 2160. Well, if you drew, did lots of more guesses, if you did 5%, 15%, 20%, and so on, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, have a go if you don't believe what's coming, uh, have a go at home. But if you did, 
you would find that with higher rate of interest, the MPV falls, but it's actually a curve. And what we've done by just taking two guesses and working between them Not very pretty there, but we've effectively assumed it's linear. Assuming it's linear, we get 13.78 or whatever it was. But as I say, because it's actually the relationship's a curve, uh, all we can really say in real life is that oh, it's about 14%. In the exam, as I say, lean it to two decimal places. But be aware, it's only approximate. Uh, and in, in real life, we don't need to be precise. We really don't. You know, in real life, you'll say it's about 14. And what's the relevance of that? Well, remember for our question, we think the cost of money is 10%, but we might be wrong. We now know that provided the cost of capital is less than, what did I get, 13.78, then we're correct to accept. Look at the graph, you know, the IRR, 13.78. So for any lower rate, the MPV is positive and we should accept. However, if there was any chance of the cost of capital being more than 13.78%, then it's negative and we would reject. And so really, it's giving us a margin for error. You see, we think it's 10%, but as I said before, it's impossible in real life to calculate it accurately. If the internal rate of return was 11%, I'd be very scared of going ahead. I think it's 10, but it only adds to change to 11, and then we start being negative. I'd be scared. On the other hand, if the internal rate of return was 20%, I wouldn't really be worried at all. I think it's 10, I might be wrong, but there's no way it's going to be more than 20. Yeah? So it gives us a margin for error. That's why it's important. Now, you're not asked to calculate the internal rate of return that often in the exam. Most questions will be just NPV. But clearly, it can be asked, so make sure you can do it. Uh, one final thing, which I'm not really going to waste time going into. It's a minor point. But there are two problems with IRR. One is, there can be more than one, which sounds very odd. You see, normally, for a project, normally, the, internal, uh, the graph looks like that. With higher interest, the MPV falls, and the IRR is when the MPV is zero. There's just one. But it is possible, in special cases, uh, this, you get a graph something like this. Now I'll tell you when it happens. It happens when you've got really strange flows. Uh, for instance, you might have a, a project where you, you had an outflow of 20. One year later, you got an inflow of 80. And then you know, after two years, an outflow again of 30. Where effectively, you start to buy an investor, then you've got spare cash, you end up being a depositor. I mean, don't worry, you wouldn't be asked to deal with this. But... If the sign keeps changing, you know, minus to plus, plus to minus, then every time it changes, potentially, there's a change in the shape. And it can result 
in there being two places <coughs> where the MPV is zero. Now I say again, you cannot ever be asked to deal with that sort of situation or draw the graph. But just be aware, for what I call a written question, the choice of statements, that there can be more than one. Uh, which then gets a bit difficult you know, to interpret. Uh, the other one is that um, you cannot use to compare investments. Sometimes it works, sometimes it wouldn't. But just think about this. Suppose you've got uh, 10,000 cash, $10,000. And I gave you a choice. You can invest all 10,000, if you want, at 2% per year interest. There's another investment which will give you 10% a year interest. But the most you can invest is 500 and the rest of it you'd have to leave invested nowhere. You either invest 500 at 10% or you invest 10,000 at 2%. Which would you choose? You wouldn't just automatically say, oh, I want this one because it... I want the second one because it gives higher interest. If I'm going to invest the same amount, then fine, obviously the higher interest the better. But here, invest 10,000, and I, I only get 2%, but that's what, $200 interest. If the only other choice was to invest 500, 10%, $50 interest, well, I'd prefer the first one. Now, I'm being extreme, as I've already said, if you could invest 10,000 in both of them, obviously you want the higher interest. But it's only valid to compare, effectively, the internal rates of return. If it is like with like, if you are investing the same amount for the same length of time, only then would it make sense to compare. Anyway. There's a danger in saying too much there. For the exam, I hate saying this, but it's not really a question of why. It's just being aware of those two statements. It's dangerous to try and compare investments based on IRR. And, whether it's clear or not, there can be more than one. Okay, there's more to come in this chapter. The two big things are what we've done. MPV, which is always there, internal rate of return. Um, certainly we are expected to be able to do it. A, the next lecture, uh, a couple of less important things, but well, important in the sense that it certainly still can be asked.